Guys, before we jump into this podcast with Paolo, I just want to inform people about a couple of cool tournaments we have coming up at our storefront. On September 26th, we have a 3v3 case tournament for Donna Majesty. And the following Sunday, we will have a double case tournament for Megatons. And additionally, we are starting Pokemon tournaments on September 25th. That will be our first one Saturdays at 1 p.m. Uh, so make sure to check us out on Facebook, on Instagram. We're trying to do all sorts of fun and exciting tournaments and different things at the store. Uh, so check us out. And here's Paolo. Today, I am joined with a special guest, Paolo. Um, Paolo, can you please introduce yourself and start off listing some of your accomplishments? So I'm Paulo. Paulo Goncalves, Gonçalves. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm 32 years old. I've been playing for many years, 16 years now. Wow. But recently, I mean, in the past, like since 2018, I started I start traveling more to the United States, more YCSs and Latin America in general. Before that, I played for many years, but I usually only played like the events in Brazil and maybe one event in another country. But then I really start traveling in 2018. And then it's when my results got a lot better. I won three premier events, two ICSs and one UDS. And <laughs> it's a funny story because I won all of them in the same month. So wow. <laughs> yeah, in three consecutive weeks. Oh my god, that's <laughs> insane. What what deck were you playing? What what form? Sky Striker. Sky Striker. This is 2019. I won ICS 3v3, the first one, Atlanta with Michelle and Hector. Okay. Um, so we won to return next week. I play a UDS in what it was in Medellin, Medellin, Colombia. Okay. And I won the UDS in the next week. I play a YCS in Guatemala. And I won this one that as well. Wow. So it was a pretty crazy month. I still can't believe that happened. And, and I have in total 24 premier event tops. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. So I'm sure there's, there's a lot uh, people can learn from you then. Um, thank you for being on. So you said you started, you've been, you were playing for 16 years. You only started traveling in the past like three, four years. Yeah. Uh, what made you decide to start traveling and take that leap? So uh, I played comparatively since the beginning. Like I started playing 2005 and 2006. I was already traveling with uh, in, in South America for my first WCQ, the Continentals back then. And I was like 16 years old, like traveling alone, which was a big deal when you had no internet and phones and all that. Those things didn't exist. Um, so it was a big deal for me, especially so young. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I live in Brazil. I couldn't travel more because I live in Brazil is super expensive. Uh, not only live here, but to also travel abroad. And I only could afford doing that when I was an adult, like I had my business going on, I have a, I have a UD store in Brazil, I do other things too. And I could only do that after like 27 years old. And yeah. I wish I could have done earlier uh, because I, 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 I knew you like from before, like because I, when you won, I was watching not the games because it wasn't stream, but like I was following the whole thing that happened. Oh, this guy was 11 years old and he won, like this is insane. So. I remember me being like young, like I probably this was 2006, right? The, the yeah. Year one, right. So I was 16, and you were you were 11, and I was like, okay, this guy is super young, and he won. And then I read all the future matches. This is something that I did, and I remember like uh, I I kind of compare myself with other people to see, okay, I know I'm good here in Brazil, but like maybe I sh should. I don't know if I'm good enough as the, as those guys like, and I read all the future matches and I I watched the the I read the games like okay in this situation with this hand I would do this this and that and then I would read the paragraph okay he did this differently why and then I started to figure out why he did something different and then I realized okay maybe maybe I know what I'm doing like of course I got much better 
when I start traveling, mm -hmm. with the experience of tournament thing that I didn't have like before. But yeah, like I wish I could have started earlier, but I couldn't. But now I'm trying to catch up. Yeah, and it's working because I, I had a pretty good three years since I started going to to US and all that. So it sounds like it. Yeah, you've got over 20 tops and those. I mean, I'm sure you topped a couple of them before, but yeah, you yeah. definitely been making up for lost time. A big chunk of them were in the past three or four years. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, how did you, how did you get into the game? What made you even start playing 16 years ago? Okay. It's a weird story because I never watched like the show really. It wasn't because the show, uh, it was a big coincidence. Like I already told this story from, I have a Yugo channel and all that. And now I have a Twitch channel too. So this story is like, is known for the Brazilian community, but probably the, the international community might not know is that I never watched the show really. And I, when I was really young, I used to play Counter-Strike. Okay. And like the, oh, not Go, like the old one, like 1.6. And in Brazil, there was this thing, like politician thing that kids could not play anymore. Like in, you, you needed to be like over 18. And then I was forced to stop uh yeah it happened for a while it's not like that anymore but like it happened for some months and then when that happened i had a friend that randomly got this Yu-Gi-Oh deck and oh, do you want to play and i said yeah sure like I, I was aware of the the show but i didn't really watch and then we start to play like no rules like the rule was there was no rules yeah so we try to do the, the, the show rules, but all, everything wrong. And then we only had one deck. And this is a funny thing because we only had one deck. It was a Yug starter deck. And then we shuffle and we put in half, right? Like I had one half and he had the other half. Mm -hmm. And in my half, the Sumnet school ended up in my half. And it was not to Sumnet school. So I kept winning every single time. There was no tribute summon, all that, but that doesn't exist. So I kept winning, winning. And I was like, okay, this game is really cool. I keep winning. I, I must be really good. So there's nothing I, that he could do for summon school. What about Dark Hole? Isn't Dark Hole in it? Or did you have the Dark Hole too? Maybe he doesn't have it. Oh, I had the Dark Rule too. What I remember is that I had, I, I probably had the Dark Rule too. And the deck was without the Dark Magician. The Dark Magician wasn't there. Okay. Because his brother trade two Beyblades for this deck. <laughs> Do you remember Beyblade? That like yeah, the, the yeah, the, anything. Those are fun. Yeah, so he trade two Beyblades for the deck, and the deck was without the Dark Magician. So the best card was the Summon School, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Maybe I got the Dark Ruler too, probably. So, yeah, so I kept winning. I said, okay, this deck. And then I got more interested because of that. And I wonder if I was the losing side if I would be so interested in the game. So uh, I, I, I like to say that that randomness changed my entire life probably. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Just getting half the deck, if you got the other half, your whole life might be different, wow. Yeah. So how did you go from playing that 20 card, half and half Yugi starter deck to becoming you know, a competitive player and, and getting better? Okay, so I was, since the beginning of my life, I noticed this drive to be competitive. Like I always want to be competitive in everything. Like if I was playing, like if I was playing video games with my friends, I, I was the one that wanted to make, okay, let's make a championship of this. Like make, okay. And this is like all the things, this is the rule. Like I was this guy. And I was kind of obsessed with some things. Like uh, I want to see all the ratio, not, not in Yu-Gi-Oh, but like, for example, I like to play some, uh, soccer games in my in the video game. So I, I didn't only choose the team. I like I look all the stats of all the plays and I was like 11, 10, I don't know. So I always been like that. Mm. I always been like that. And when I started playing Yu-Gi-Oh, I like the same thing happened. Like, okay, I didn't stop on the card. Like I start to research online. So that's why I I I I found out about metagame and 
there was Pojo and then the list grounds, all those things I was aware. For example, I don't know if you remember, there was a German forum. It was ETCG, the name, I think, mm-hmm. like 2007. Mm-hmm. It's a forum like Pojo, but it was German. And of mm-hmm. course, I don't know, I don't know German. But I put all everything on the Google Translator and I just only see the deck list, like the names of the cards are all messed up because I had no idea what is happening. But like I put all the names of the cards on the Google to find which card it was and do that one by one to, to take away like the deck list and see what's happening. Like I I did all that. Wow. For nothing. And then I slowly starting getting into the competitive scene. Since the beginning of the competitive scene in Brazil, which I think started in 2006, my first nationals in Brazil, we had nationals, we still do. Uh, I played the first national and I did well, like I, I, I ended up in 10th place. That's really uh, good. Yeah, I ended up in 10th place. And the same year I played this, the first WCQ, which I got 13. It was top eight, so I didn't top. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, if we start like that, it was almost since the beginning, I started getting super competitive, but I think it was because of my personality from the start. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Did you have like friends to play test with that you could bounce ideas off of? Or how big was the Brazilian community even for UEO? It is pretty big. It's I mean, big. of course, it is not comparable to US and other yeah. countries like that, but I think it's big. I think it's big. We have a lot of players. Uh, the problem is that since it's Brazil, many things are more expensive than they shouldn't be because of the, all the taxes that we have. Mm-hmm. And I had a lot of friends, like the locals were big, not, now they are smaller than before, but like in that time, like 2005, 2006, was the boom of Yu-Gi-Oh in Brazil. Like the, the anime was, the TV show was on like, in, it wasn't only cable, it was like on the main, uh, how do I say this? On the main TV, like the main channels of the TV didn't yeah, yeah, pay. Yeah. So it was a mainstream TV show. It wasn't like something niche. Gotcha. So it was super like many people were playing. So this is when I started. And there was a lot of people. I, I had like the teams, like the, 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 we have teams of, of friends and then we travel together only for like nearby cities. Mm-hmm. and it was more or less how it started gotcha and so were you i assume you weren't having success right away i mean you just say you got 10th at your first nationals um mm-hmm. what made so what made you better than like so many other players right off the bat just just doing that constant research and reading metagame and analyzing how certain people were playing their hands and how you would play the hands and see the difference and just play testing a lot i assume yeah, I played a lot and uh, that happened. Uh, I think the fact that I did this whole hard work like of researching and see what other people were doing and like trying to figure out myself if I agree or not with all those things, that was the type of thing that not many players did here. Probably because there was no incense- incentive to do that because we didn't have like as many tournaments as, as like there was no premier events. Like the only premier event was the nationals and the continentals only two per year and Mm -hmm. only a few people could have done that so if you look that way there was not many sensitive to be to even try to be good i'm sure there were people that would be able to do that and and like they would they have the 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 ability to do that but they decide not to to decide not to do because there was no reason to Mm -hmm. but i like that so much that i did anyway and that's why i think uh I got like this head start. Me and only a few people were like that. And we could clearly see the difference between the guys that did and the guys that didn't. And we kind of dominate the scene for like uh, some years in Brazil. Now it's, it's more because it's a funny thing, but uh, YouTube, I don't think it didn't exist. Or if it did, there was no YouTube community uh, yeah. for Yu Gi Oh! that yeah. didn't exist. This is like, 2010 forward thing. This is not a thing that we had that we had before. So, in order for you to even have this knowledge, you need to research. You go to Meta Game. Everything's in English. Not everyone is proficient in English to to mm-hmm. read everything, and understand, and analyze. Like this is the type of thing that there's a lot of barriers that I think the Brazilian community had before. Now they have less barriers because 
that is way more information, easy information to find in many ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. So what do you what do you think about the game right now? What do you think of the the current format? I think it's fine-ish. Like fine-ish. I wish it, yeah, I, I I wish it was better. We've seen worse. For example, last year was much worse than it is right now. I think there are a lot of things that could be improved. Um, and the card pool, like I think this card pool is really old already. Like the fact that uh, we are still playing with invoked cards, for example, this is a flaw in the, in my opinion, of course, in the on how Konami is designed the game going forward. Because I think they did a good thing by not releasing better cards in order to make the old cards unplayable because then you increase the power creep and the deck usually that tends to do like bad things to the game. Yeah. And the only way they can rotate the game, not making same cards is take away the cards through the ban list. That's the only way. There's no other way. You have two ways to rotate the metagame. You either make better cards or you rotate the worst, the, the old cards and give space for the new ones. Mm -hmm. They are not making broken cards, which I agree, but they are not rotating the metagame. So what's happening, they're releasing product after the product. You probably have probably noticed mm -hmm. that some products are really bad. And they're not bad because they are bad. They are bad in comparison to yeah. what we have. So yeah. maybe if we didn't have um, that same decks for that much time, maybe we could have been playing with new different archetypes already. And I think this is just an assumption. Maybe this next list will be the one that we'll try to do just like the, I don't know if you were active, but like in 2000, last year, last year, in the beginning of the last year, they like ban Engage, ban Stalio, ban Colossus, and ban something else. Like they ban the main card of four decks yes. just to try to rotate them at a game. And it did. It did. And I think yeah. it could be similar now. You think the answer is to to ban more cards then basically because you don't think printing like more powerful cards and creating more of a power creep is the an answer. You think more just banning some of the cards that are in the current format to switch it up basically? Yeah, I think uh, we are already like almost on the line like of the as strong as the game could get without completely destroying the 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 healthy of the game in my opinion mm. it's so i think it's, it's not awful but i don't think it's on the good side sometimes people um think that diversity is equal a health environment which in my opinion is not the only thing that you use you need to use to measure if a, a, a form a meta game is healthy or not for example this meta game is super uh you have a lot of you have a lot of diversity in this metagame, a lot of decks that you can play, but that's not the only fact that you can use because for example, you can have a lot of decks and the, every single one of them, which is almost like the case, is really difficult to win when seconds into those decks. Like if Triton plays without you using a trap, it's almost like an FTK. The same for Trap Gates, the same for Prank Kids. Um, it's really difficult, it's impossible. No, yes, sometimes you can have like a really strong hand with like droplets and talons and lightning storm and free engine cards and you can break some board, yeah. But like, this is only unlikely side of the things. Mm -hmm. I think in order to even try to play the game right now, you need to have like this uh, necessity to stop your opponent and many decks can play over one hand trap kind of easily. So I think we are already on a like, is difficult to 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 break boards and like to prevent boards even so if you make cards that are better than the cards that we have right now just with the intention to push them away and play and sell the new cards like and sell the new product mm -hmm. is going to be bad yeah and i think they noticed that and that's yeah. why they didn't print those cards and um, but they need to rotate somehow because yes you didn't make a better deck so you make a, a slightly worse but let's say the sword soul i think sword soul like if put sword soul inside this metagame right now i don't think it would be better than a tribigate or than a prank it. i think it would be worse um Interesting. not by much not by much it would be one of the decks here yeah. but it wouldn't have the impact that i think they need 
a new product after one year without something too impactful needed to be. Uh, so I think they need to do something along those lines. And I think they will, because people are also tired of playing with the same deck. That's deck. also a factor. Yeah. So what would you change right now? What cards would you ban right now to switch up the metagame? Yeah, this is a really difficult to do. I'm just giving the general idea, but like I don't have the exact answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they have way more data than me, like just one sure. person playing my own experiences, but like they should have more data than me because of the, all the results of the, all the events. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those four decks need to be addressed somehow. Uh, Dryton, Brankids, Tribigate, what's the last one? I'm forgetting something, it's four. Dragonlink, Dragonlink. Uh, I think Dragonlink is the less likely to be hit because the LP just got banned. But I think something should change. And I'm not saying because I don't like Dragon Link, which I don't. But like, it is because, yeah, it is because of the, the this whole thing that I'm saying. Like, I'm, I'm trying to yeah. look at like Konam point of view here, not me. Uh, because it's I, looking at the next release and looking at Dragon Link, I think it's hard to justify playing something else instead of this. Mm -hmm. And they need to make somehow you need to change. So, for example, in Dragon Link, I think the card that you, you might need to touch could be Kills of Space and Quick Launch. I think you need to hit the consistency slash extender of those decks because those cards are the two things at the same time. They are consistent and are extenders. Which card? Uh, uh, kills of Space and Quick Launch. Chaos Wave, okay. Incredible. And not, maybe not two at the same time, but like some. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Tribigate, it's really, really difficult to touch. Uh, because it sounds sensible, like if you do, if you do, like, it, I don't think you can ban something. I mean, if you ban something, you kill the deck. So maybe you try to put like I don't know fractal to one, but it would make the deck a lot worse. Yeah. Well, uh, so, but I think it's something that might happen because trying to give, at least from the perspective that I'm watching, it is the best performing deck. Many people don't agree it's the best deck, but it is the best performing deck. So on the average player level, in extravaganzas and all those type of tournament the removals, that is probably the metric that economy use. Um, so I think Tropic Gates is going to be super hit in this one. Mm. Um, Frank Gates is, I think Dudu to one is a good, um, a good hit because it would make the prank kids uh, at least more weak to villain perm because since they have two dudus villain perm are not that good because they can make another one mm -hmm. uh, so one to do is possible and dry i think is the other deck that might got like a big list maybe like i don't know a bentain band or something like that mm. I, again i don't know exactly what they, they will do but i think it's likely that they do something to to try to rotate this somehow yeah, change up the game. Well, especially because um, this next set is supposed to be really good. Yeah. So they want it, you know, they need to make it sell well and they're releasing these new archetypes. So yeah, that makes sense. It's the best potential set, I think, that we have, like, I don't know, probably this year. The best, yeah. it has the most potential in a lot of different lines. You have like free decks and we have like probably TCG exclusives with the exact thing that was already decent in the first, but like the beer trooper deck, maybe with more things that will happen in the next set, maybe got better. But it's, like I said, it's difficult to just fight playing that over tribe again. Like it's really difficult. So how do you do that? You can't make the cards better. You just, because they are already there, like they can change the text of the card they already printed. So, yeah. I mean, they usually don't do that. So that's the ability that other card games have, not Yu-Gi-Oh. Really, they, just they did change. more and yeah, yeah, like Huntera, Hearthstone, they just change costs and test, test yeah. of the cards. Like they change things, they can't do this here. So the only way is to take away the card. There's no other way. So I think that will happen. Interesting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So you didn't like Donna Majesty. You didn't think it had any effect on the format. This Donna Majesty is the current set, right? Yeah, the one yeah. that just got at, from no impact yeah. at all. It almost like it didn't exist. I don't even know. Like, what I do know about the set is the the new infusion, which barely had any. Like, I don't even remember a card that besides the insect deck, which is interesting, but like absolutely no way to compete with the 
the current decks. Yeah. It's a really interesting deck. Like that's the that's the thing. Like it's an interesting deck. It sounds good. It has the good components to be a decent deck, but it's just not good enough in comparison. Mm -hmm. I think that deck being a good deck in the metagame would be nice because it doesn't do anything too insane. Like it it, it, it constrains itself inside insect archetype archetype. So you cannot go like crazy, go like middle fiber, or whatever. Yeah. You you go you don't go like too out of control uh, because everything it was made with the intention to be like close in that archetype, which is cool. I think they are doing a good job on that. I think the ban list and that can happen. That maybe the reason is like the whole pandemic thing, and that's why they slowing down the whole ban list cycle. Yeah. Maybe that's the reason. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah, the maybe, reason. That makes sense. Maybe that's the reason. They go, okay, people are not playing the events. Maybe we're going to, like, instead of rotating the format in, like, one year, let's do one year and a half so people have more time to play the card that they bought in the pandemic, whatever. Like, that could be a reason. And that would be a fair reason. The, the problem is that we don't know. So, but I think even if that's the reason, I think it's enough. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's enough time. I think it's enough. I think most people are already, already really tired. Of the yeah. Current metagame. Yeah, you're not the first person who's who said that. Yeah. Cool. So, how much do you normally um, play test? Like, how much do you play? You know, in a normal week, and how much more do you play test before an event? So, I mean, we are in a different circumstance right now. So, I play less than before. For example, when I was traveling a lot for events, I I I was playing more. Not only like testing but also in the event so i was always competing and that of course helps now um i do play a lot because i work with you right i have my store i have the youtube i have the two channel and i do coaches so this is what i do mm -hmm. for living uh so i like playing like this is the nice part but i also have to play because I need to be knowledgeable of the things that I'm going to, like people are paying me, like I go, I, I, I do coaches through Dulish Academy for the international people, like and I have a lot of students there and I need to be knowledgeable, of course they are paying for a service, right? So I need to know what I'm talking about. So, uh, so I do play, but I don't play as much as I would if I were testing for a YCS that I need to pay, I don't know, $1,000 to go to, which is usually the price I have to pay. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's really expensive. I live in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. It's like yeah. really down there. So for example, for me to go for like, let's say LA, which I already did like crazy. I play in Pasadena in 2019. I, it's like $800 Jeez. to go. Yeah, it's really expensive. And like if you travel inside US, it's like, like $200, I don't know. It's much less. Yeah, it's, it is. It is much yeah. Less. Oh. Okay, so so you'll put in like, so think, like, what would you say you play like five hours a day before an event? Uh, uh, or before, maybe close to event, could be, could be like yeah. close to event, like in preparation for something really important. Yeah. In average, like today, like in the normal situation, I would play like one, two hours per day. I like to be cons consistent, like playing every day a little bit at least mm -hmm. uh, to not be... But I think playing is not the only way that you can get better and improve. Like there's a lot of way playing is one. Um, playing is different than testing. Like testing is one thing. Testing is like playing with purpose, right? Like when you're testing, you're testing something. Like you're testing this deck against this deck or this card against this situation. You're testing something. So playing is like me logging the link book and playing random matches. And that's and that's is one thing that you can do to improve. And that's valid. But you cannot only do that. You can sure. you need to do other things like and then I have testing sessions with the my my friends, the players that I'm testing with. Mm -hmm. Uh I do a lot of research still. Like I kind of have to know everything. Like I know what like Jess Cotton talked like when he played the his last event. This is the type of knowledge that I need to have because not only is good for me to know what a good player is playing, obviously. But also, this is the type of poison that people tend to copy. So it's good for me to know what this thunder build is because whatever it is is the thunder now. It doesn't matter if I agree or not. I usually do agree, but like let's say I don't agree. Uh, doesn't matter. I need to know. Yeah. Uh, and I do that not only for him, but like for, for example, Pack. I think 
I think you talked to Pac recently, right? I did, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I saw that. For example, he's a really, uh, really smart guy and kind of new to the scene, but he's really impactful in the things that he's saying. Again, don't need to agree, but I need to know. So I need every, I, I see everything he says is important. Trif, all these big personalities in the community are important for me to know. So these are not the thing that you can do in order to get better. And you do a little bit of everything. So if you count, he has only played one match a day, but I've been doing other things in my day. Like I watch a video here and there while I'm lunching, I saw a video and I heard something and I talk with my friends, like in, in chats and whatever. So I constantly doing something. Of course, it's not the entire day. I do other things. I'm married. I have like, what? I have a life. All those things happen too. But this is a big part of my life, big important thing I do like. So yeah that's great that's awesome that you're able to do what you're passionate about yeah um so you had said that when you started traveling to american events you also learned some like more and you got better uh -huh. um what did you learn when you started competing at like american events and, and flying internationally so because i assume there are people who maybe here want to start flying and competing at YCSs. And so maybe you can kind of share what you learned when you started competing at YCSs. Yeah. So in the game, you can clearly, clearly see a difference in my results as like right after I start traveling a lot. And I mean, it could be many, many reasons, but one that I believe is true is that when I was playing before, I had like two events per year. Like there were the events for me. And maybe there was a lot of pressure on that because if I play this one event, let's say my continent, the WCQ, and then I don't top, all the knowledge that I gather for that event, it's only for that event. It, yeah. I, there's nothing else that I can play that I can use that knowledge on. Maybe I have a bad day, maybe I wasn't unlucky, and it's all for nothing. Like, I mean, not all for nothing. I, I top almost every single WCQ that I play. I talked, but I didn't win. And here, only win matter because only first it goes to work, right? So, and then you have to, you can't use that anymore. The, the, it's different when you play in some place like North America, where you have uh, YCS almost every single month. Sometimes you have more. If you're willing to travel, you can play more than once. Like you can play one there and one in South America. You can play like twice a month, like big events. And in between then you have regionals, you have like, like 500, 600, 1,000 player regionals, yeah. you have a lot to play. So when you play one event, like let's say a YCS, and then you don't do well for some reason, like maybe you decide something wrong or maybe you got unlucky, like you need to analyze and see like what happened. Mm -hmm. It's not everything goes to like, because you have like in two weeks, you know you're going to play again the same meta game more or less in the same situation. And that really changed things for me. Like, like you take away this pressure of me, okay, I need the result right now. For example, before winning those free events, it was in March. It was March or April, but like the, the month before, I think it was March. In February, I played two ICSs. So I played two ICSs in February and three ICSs in March. So those February YCSs was the same at a game, more or less. And I didn't talk any of those two, but I learned a lot out of those losses. Imagine if I didn't have anything to play, I would never would be able to use that knowledge that I gather from those losses and the things that I learned from those in anyone else. But yeah. luckily I did the free <laughs> events, which I won. So I don't think it's a coincidence that the playing a lot helps a lot, Yeah, like the big events. Can can you share what you learned at those three events? Like, was there anything specific? It wasn't you... more about the meta call of the situation. For okay. example, I played YCS Chicago in the beginning of February and decided to play Sky Striker. And it wasn't a bad choice, but I didn't do really well, probably because I was I was not as prepared as I should be for the new deck, which is a Thunder Dragon deck, the Thunder Dungeon, because LP was just released. So I wasn't well prepared, in my opinion. So I went X3 and it didn't top. It wasn't bad. Like, yeah. it was like, I got like 40 something, 50 yeah, something. It wasn't bad. Around. But yeah. I mean, for my standards back then, it was, it felt like a failure. And then what I decided to do in, in three weeks, I had another YCS with YCS Dusseldorf in Germany. And I decided to change that. I decided to play Thunder Dragon for that event. And I tested Thunder Dragon for three weeks straight, like a lot. And that one is, that's a lot. But 
and then I played the turn ranking that went really poorly. I went like four three uh, in X three by around seven. Really bad results for me. And then, but something changed between Chicago and Dusseldorf. Salomon Great were released, and that changed everything because Salomon Great was nice. It wasn't that good. Like it got worse in the future, but like at that point specific, it was nice against the Thunder Dragon deck, which it was I was playing. But Sky Striker could be really good against Salomon Great. Salomon Great was really popular because it was really cheap and it was the new shiny thing people like. People like to play with the new deck, so I need to. I needed to take that in consideration. So I played the, the Thunder Dragon deck, didn't do well, but it's, I realized that something changed. It was the rise of a sound great, and maybe the sound great would help me to beat the Thunder Dragons. It couldn't be me. Like, and then I needed to play against the Salomon Greats and the Sky Striker Mirrors, and those I would be good, because in the sound, in Sky Striker Mirror I was really good already. And Salomon Great, I had a good deck, and that's what happened. In the 3v3, I, I came back to Sky Striker with all those things that I learned from the previous events in mind. And I changed the Sky Striker with the intention to beat the, the Salomon Great and Sky Striker and have some respect for the Thunder Dragon deck. And I only played Thunder Dragons in the top eight, top eight, top four, and the finals of the YCS. I played against the Thunder Dragons three times in the top cut. But before that, the meta call was really, really well done, I think, because I played mostly against the things that I think I would have, and I did. But the top heavy of the event was still on the drag, but I was pre much better prepared, not to encourage themselves, but like the way you play, I was more prepared because I was more used, used to that. And then, yeah, that's more or less the reason that changes everything, I think, for me in those events. That's why it was really important. Well, wow, yeah. So just being able to choose the right deck and um, picking a deck that, you know, has a good matchup against everything in a sense, or at least not a bad matchup against everything yeah. or anything. Uh, because, you know, if you can respect and hold your own against Thunder and then have a good matchup against the other two decks, then it kind of makes sense to play that deck because it's like a well-rounded balance versus all three and your skill can kind of shine through in the mirror match and then maybe in the Thunder Dragon as well. Yeah. Uh, and then knowledge only happened because I need the failures on those two. So mm -hmm. I wonder if I didn't have the other events, what would happen, right? So that's why yeah. the whole traveling a lot helped me. So if people have, if the person has the, the willing to get better in Yu-Gi-Oh! Because not only that, like when you travel a lot, you get more used to play in like in pressure environments. Like you get more used to play against the known players before mm -hmm. you start becoming player uh, a known player yourself. But like before that started, you, you got more used to play. You got you got to see those players every like not every but like every month and all that. And then you got to start to more use. Like it's not that scary anymore. And then it's it's better. It's better. Yeah. Did it help that also that you played the Thunder Dragon deck too? So that when you were going up against it, you knew like exactly what they wanted to do and set up in each situation so that you knew the ins and outs and when absolutely. To I, like in the in Chicago, I had, I had almost no idea what's happening. That was super new to me. I didn't thought that it would have impact that he did, that the deck did. And then I noticed it was good, and then it changed. But then Salomon Great was released, and then it was weird, and then it come back. But the the whole process that I went through, well, like okay, I need to learn this deck now. When I come back to Sky, and then okay, now I need to play against Thunder Dragon. In this perspective. It was much better because I had, like, I could easily see what my opponent was trying to do when he was trying to do something mm -hmm. before. No, so yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that's maybe good advice too to people is to learn how to play every deck. Just you know how to count them and you know what it yeah. wants to do, trying to do. Um. <clears throat> Well, yeah, I don't even want to touch too much more on this current format because I think everyone's getting kind of tired of this format. You know? <laughs> There's not much. It's been the same format for basically a year, it seems like, and a lot yeah. of the cards are, a lot of the gems have been discovered and whatnot. Um, so usually I ask, like, what's an underrated card that you think uh, there is, but I, I don't know if you have one that comes to mind immediately, or if it's just everything's kind of been discovered and yeah, I mean, I've, I've been playing with, okay, this is a little bit weird, but like, I've been playing with Trabigate, but I, I mix Trabigate with Melfi cards uh, mm -hmm. because of this one card, it's Obedience School. Uh, 
uh, a really old card that brings three beasts directly from your deck and locks in two beasts. And I think this card is pretty cool. Um, so I think this deck has potential. I've been playing with that uh, recently, and I think it's fine. Like, maybe not as good as the Zoo Tribe Gate. I don't know. But I think it's up there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. But I think it's something different. It's something different. Yeah. It's really hard to do something different right now. So the fact that I, I'm doing something different, that I do believe, like, genuinely, that is something that, okay, this can compute. It's difficult to do right now. So uh, it's nice. It's different. Yeah, it's cool. It's really I, I do like the card. I do like the card. Um, what's your... Uh, what You think the game's gotten more skilled since you've been playing for so long? Is mm -hmm. the game more skilled for now or back then? It's really difficult to answer this. I think... Okay, so... I think it's before. I think it's before. I, I, I played before and I play now and I play competitive the whole time. I never stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I went through everything. <laughs> and it is still uh, really skillful now. Mm -hmm. But it depends when you say now. Now, now, then absolutely before. But there was other nows. Like 2019, I think it was pretty good. Like this whole... Not because I did well, like when I won the events, but when you won the event. yeah, like not saying because of that, but it was better. Like it was a, a modern Yu Gi Oh! But I think it was one of the best modern Yu Gi Oh's we had, like 2019. I think 2017 was also good because of Zoo, Zoo Mirrors was pretty good. Uh, so the format was fine there, 2017. 2014 was fine. Then we bring back a lot, but like those years was, were fine. There were bad years between like 2018 was awful, 2020 was awful. If you go like super before like 2006, 7, 8, if you compare like on average those years, on well, average with now, I think those before were better. And I think the, 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 the main factor is probably the amount of time that you have to play like turns, like numbers of decisions numbers of, mm -hmm. because i remember like something that almost doesn't happen anymore it does sometimes but, like it doesn't happen anymore like bluffs bluffs was a thing like a really like a big thing before you could bluff a guard you could bluff a torrential a mirror force a heavy storm you could set every storm and shit like you could do a lot of things and those type of things doesn't exist anymore that's why i it's really clear you can divide the Yu-Gi-Oh from before and from now but there is a lot of things to consider now i think for example one thing that's way more complex now is the amount of lines that you have to think per like i think the amount of process that you need to think per turn now it's much higher than before mm -hmm. like the amount of things that you need to consider it the issue is that sometimes, even if you don't consider everything, the cards are so powerful that you win anyway. And that's the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, when, yes, you could have like, that's A, which is much better than B. But B is so strong that you might win anyway. And that's the problem. And that's why the power level needs to be small. I think there is somewhere a modern Yu-Gi-Oh that is skill level like the thinking about this perspective skill level better than before and i think this is when the power level started it's lower a little lower than mm -hmm. now so yeah i think we come close in 2019 in my opinion we come close to 2017 i think there were situations times in those years that is usually when the games are much lower like zoo sky salad like i don't think it's a coincidence that those decks are the ones in those times and this is just my opinion right like people prefer combo decks mirror i don't know why but some people do I hate uh, right now. Uh, yeah. so i think those type of situation need to happen less and less and those like Salon Great Dex, Sky Dex, Zoo Dex, like this type of modern decks need to happen more often. Like the, the exact deck, it has the same vibe of those decks. So it sounds happy. Even the Invoker deck, it has the same vibe. Like you, you have some special summons, but you, you still normal summon. Like you don't do like 13 summons per turn. Like you do like four or five, which is much more than before, but it's not completely out of control. Yeah. So it's some, I think there is some, some potential to have a better format. Then we have like 2007, for example, or 2006. Now, because it would be 
a little bit slower, faster than before, but a little bit slower, but super skill intensive in, in other aspects, like the amount of things that you need to consider, it, which is a lot right now, even in the current format. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, what's your favorite format ever? Is it when Sky Striker when you won three events? I do like that a lot. <laughs> uh, I do like that a lot. I like it. I mean, some of them that I already mentioned, I do like 2017 Zoo. I do like Dragon Ruler too. It was a little, a little small for me, but only a few months, but it was good. 2014 was so fine, like the, the whole Burning Abyss, Shadow, Plea, and Necros, like a little bit later, I think it was fine too. Um, it's some of those, I think. It's not the older ones. I think I'm really attached to the, to the whole tournament thing because back then we had the format, but I had nothing to play into. Like, okay, I played regionals and all that. Like for example, 2017, I played Perfect Circle. 2007, sorry, I played Perfect Circle, but I only played regionals. So I don't have the same like comparison that I can do right now where I played 2017, I played the Continentals and YCS and all that, right? Sure. So I have nothing to compare to see if I was actually good with that in comparison to other people and to see if it was exactly good. I think it was, uh, but I'm like, it's better for me to think about things that happened after I got more competitive yeah. in the sense yeah. that I travel more. That makes sense. Yeah, so I think those format, like I really like 2019 to be honest. I really like the Sky format. Uh, Sala and all that, but the, the other ones are good too. The, the, the 2017, 2014, I think. Okay. Um, did you ever have like a breakthrough moment where you think like something clicked for you and you became a lot better all of a sudden, or like you realized something in the game that changed your whole like mindset or the way you perceive it? Mm, not really. Like, not okay. I, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but like this whole traveling more thing it was the thing that really changed i i read the i disagree with like a lot of things hoban said like when he played in his book i disagree with a lot of things um but one thing that catch my eye in his book which i did read was the whole in order for you to win events you need to play events and that sounds obvious but this is kind of when it changed for me is like okay i will need to do something extra to make this happen because I was playing when I read this book was probably 2016 maybe 15 or 16 mm -hmm. and I was traveling a little bit but not like a lot and then it was decided okay I need to travel more man I need to travel more like I'm wasting time I need to do something that make me able to play more events and then this we can call this a breakthrough moment because it was when it changed, like, okay, I need to play more. There's no other way. I can't play two, three events per year. It's too little. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing like, okay, I realize I need to, I don't know, save my cards for later or whatever. Like, it's not a, like a technical play thing that changed. Yeah. It was more an approach of how to approach tournament thing. I think that was the most important thing for me. Gotcha. Um, do you have a favorite card of all time? Is it someone's cool? <laughs> so it's going to change my life, right? Um, I think one card that I like a lot is Enemy Controller. And I always try to, to play Enemy Controller in things, and I'm always happy when that's possible. I really like Enemy Controller. That is a cool card. Enemy Very controller. versatile. Yeah, I really like I, I wish the game had more opportunities to cards like that to be possible to play again, which is difficult to do right now because your deck needs to be like hand and hand traps. So... <laughs> It's hard to play niche card that can do tricky things. It's difficult to have the possibility yeah, to do that sure. right now. For sure. Yeah. Um, if you could change one rule, what would it be? Oh, I saw that in Pac's video, and I will repeat him. Uh, the whole draw six cards on turn one. I think I can only see yeah, going second. Like when you go second, instead of drawing the six and then draw one on draw phase you draw six already and you don't draw anymore mm -hmm. uh, for the next turn i think that's a really easy change to do and that make a lot of things better in the the technical part of you and even in the whole uh 
let's say, organized play for Konami part, because I think the games would go a lot faster because people would scoop uh, earlier yeah. if they see something it's impossible to break. You already know your cards, but also make going second better, which is a necessity right now, in my opinion, because I mean, <laughs> many combos are too strong, and then you see six cards, so you increase the likelihood of so seeing yeah. going second hand traps. And then if your deck is not playing in trap, let's say your deck's playing breakboard cards like that glue no more or storm droppers, those cards. If you see six already, you know the ones that you have. So depending, you can scoop if you have a chance, or you can wait. Uh, you scoop if you don't have a chance, and you can wait if you do. Now you need to wait to see if your top deck is going to save you. 95% doesn't. Yeah. And then you waste like 10 minutes like watching opponent's combo because it takes a time, takes a lot of time. And then it, this drags tournaments. I, 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 I see all the upsides, in my opinion. That's like the easiest one to change, like the, the Yu-Gi-Oh rule. Yeah, I hope, I hope they saw this. Like I, I, I've, I've, I, I've been pretty vocal about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, smart. I this like is it. doable, this is so doable. It is, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Yu-Gi-Oh moment of all time? Oh, well, definitely when I when we won the the three three, because um, we were on like there were only two Latin America teams. The entire event was its first three v three, and I played with a friend of mine, like from Brazil, Michelle, and the other friend, which is actor from Chile. So we are a South America team. The only one year event, and. Uh, we had a really difficult top cut. Probably one of the most insane top cut brackets. I don't know, man. I played against Bodan in top 16. I played against Christian Marina. I played against uh, Jesse Cottons in final. We, we won against the favorites because they were the favorites. Jesse Cotton, and Zala, and Furman. Mm. Um, so we had an insane top cut bracket. And it was really rewarding to uh, to win that event in those circumstances, being the the, the only Latin uh, South America team, and that was a stream, and it was a big thing because it was the first every three, by far the most insane moment that I had. Like it was really really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. That sounds like a very tough competition you're going up against. Yeah. Sweet. Well. Um... Yeah, I think I'm all out of questions. So thank you so yeah. much for uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. It was great getting to talk to you, and um, I hope we get to meet soon. You know, once COVID comes to an end, and start traveling again. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, I go to LA again. I will probably will. There's always events in LA. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll be traveling to all the. I assume I'll be at all the events. Uh, you know, once everything starts up, and I assume you will be too. So I'm sure. We'll yeah, I will for sure. Yeah. Do you want to plug your uh, like YouTube channel or any or, yeah. academy or anything like that? So I'm coach on the List Academy. So if anyone is interested to have sessions with me or anyone that we have a lot of good players there that can also be coaches, just take a look on the List Academy. Um, I have my own YouTube channel, which I do content in Portuguese, but I do in English too. And I have my Twitch channel, which I just started and it's doing pretty, good, pretty well from this from the start and i'm really impressed and happy about that and i will be doing um content into in, on twitch uh in portuguese and english so yeah i hope you guys like the whole scene that i have and that's it perfect yeah what's your youtube channel it's prj ygo prj ygo ygo here it is so All right, yeah, I'll make sure to glass. Absolutely. I'll put that mm -hmm. in the YouTube video in the description. Twitch is the same thing. Yep. All right, sweet. I'll put those in the description. Yeah, go check it out. Go check it out. Pilo's a great player. And I'm sure you can <laughs> learn a lot from him. Well, sweet. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.